Oh, bring us a figgy pudding, oh, bring us a figgy pudding, oh, bring us a figgy pudding, and bring it right here. Now, what is that song referring to? Well, in today's video, I'm going to show you. I'm making an English Christmas pudding, but not just any pudding recipe. The first published recipe for it in England from 1845 by Eliza Acton. She calls this the author's Christmas pudding. Now scholars debate whether she's referring to herself as the cookbook author or to Charles Dickens, who coined the term Christmas pudding in a Christmas carol published only two years earlier. So join me today as I share with you this quintessentially British Christmas favorite and share with you some of the traditions and history that go along with it. I'm also excited to tell you that today's video is a collaboration with Gary over at the channel Big Spud. He is going to make a modern twist on this British classic by making a pudding with a candied orange cooked inside of it. So make sure to go check out his version after this video. I've linked it below. So now let's get started on this Christmas British classic. This is a pretty simple recipe in the sense that you just put all of the ingredients in a bowl and stir them together. Put 170 grams or about one cup of raisins in the bowl with 170 grams or one cup of dried currants. And then you're going to add 60 grams or three quarters of a cup of candied peel. I'm using orange here. Then you're going to add a half a teaspoon of nutmeg and a half of teaspoon of mace and a pinch of salt. Then add 85 grams or two thirds of a cup of all purpose flour. And I like to give things a stir as I go along. And then 85 grams or two thirds of a cup of breadcrumbs. Now add 140 grams or two thirds of a cup of brown sugar and 110 grams or three quarters of a cup of shredded or finely diced apples. And then comes the ingredient most Americans will have a horrendous time trying to find, beef suet. This is the protective fat from around the kidney of a cow. I was lucky to find some in the meat section of the grocery store, but it's not nicely packaged like the British product that comes in pellets. I had to pull apart the sinew and grate this, but if you can find this, it is very much worth it. It lends a richer mouthfeel and flavor than butter would. But if you absolutely can't find it, you can substitute grated butter or shortening. And then you're going to add three ounces or 90 milliliters of brandy and three eggs lightly beaten. Stir that all together until combined. Making a Christmas pudding is supposed to be a family affair. The whole family has traditionally gotten involved with each member taking a turn to stir the pudding. Everyone gets to make a wish for the year ahead when it's their turn. And tradition states that you should stir the pudding from east to west in honor of the three wise men who visited the baby Jesus. Sometimes a sixpence or sil silver coin is also put in to bring good luck to the person who receives it in their slice. And the tradition of making the pudding is usually saved for the fifth Sunday before Christmas called Stirrup Sunday. The name of the day comes from the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, where the collect for that day is, Stirrup we beseech thee, O Lord, the wills of thy faithful people, that they, plenteously bringing forth the fruit of good works, may of thee be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hearing the words of the collect was a reminder to make the pudding far enough in advance before Christmas to allow it to age, which helps the flavors to develop. Some even age their puddings an entire year, using stirrup Sunday to make a Christmas pudding for the following year. Now back to the pudding, you're going to transfer your mixture to a pudding basin, which is either a thick stoneware bowl that has a lip around the edge or a metal shaped mold like this one, which actually also has a lid. Before I owned a real pudding mold, however, I used a thick glass Pyrex bowl that had a lip around the edge. So you can use that if you don't want to buy a special mold. Just make 
sure that it's made for cooking and being exposed to high heat, but I will link some actual pudding basins below if you're interested. Before pudding basins were used, however, it was common practice to boil both savory and sweet puddings in the stomach of an animal, and then later on the practice changed to boiling them in an oiled and floured cloth, which is why you see Christmas puddings in Victorian imagery in the shape of a ball, the shape coming from hanging them in the pot in a pudding cloth. You'll need a one liter mold for this recipe, Mine are smaller than that, so I'm making two smaller puddings. You're going to grease the mold and then put a circle of parchment at the bottom. Then take your mixture and press it firmly in the bowl so you don't have any large air pockets when you turn it out. Then take another circle of parchment and place it on top. Now you're going to make the cover for your pudding with a sheet of parchment and a sheet of foil on top and put a pleat in them so that they can expand from the steam of the pudding. Then you're going to place it on top and form it tightly around your basin, and then trim off any excess around the bottom. Now take kitchen twine and tie it very tightly under the lip of the mold, then do the same thing on the opposite side, and then take the hanging strings from both sides and tie a handle so that you can lift your pudding in and out of the pot safely. Now put a saucer upside down in your pot and place your pudding on top of that. Your pot needs to be big enough to put the lid tightly on. Then pour boiling water two thirds the way up your pudding basin, but don't fill it too high because you don't want water to get into the pudding. Then put the lid on and let it simmer for three hours. Don't be alarmed if your pudding makes a lot of noise while it steams. Charles Dickens in A Christmas Carol referred to this sound as singing in the pot. The exact quote is, the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. Copper here refers to the big copper basins that the Victorians would use to boil laundry in. Now you can remove it from the pot and turn it out onto a cooling rack or you can eat it warm and enjoy it the same day. It is traditional though to let it age at least five weeks. I allowed mine to cool and then put it back in the washed basin and covered it with a lid. Two weeks into the aging, I poked holes in it with a toothpick and fed it about two tablespoons of brandy, both for flavor and to keep it well preserved. I stored it in a cool dry place with the lid on and then you can enjoy it on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve by boiling it in the same manner that we originally boiled it, but for this time you only need to boil it for one hour instead of three. Then you turn it out onto your serving platter and you can light it on fire with brandy and serve it with brandy butter or custard or brandy sauce. And you will see me in the Be Real lighting it on fire. And the way to do this is to take a ladle full of brandy and warm your ladle over a candle. And then once it's warm, slightly let your ladle tip so that some of the brandy hits the flame of the candle. And then that will light your ladle of brandy on fire. And then you pour it over the warmed pudding and then you'll have a beautiful blue light show of the brandy on fire on the pudding. Wasn't it fun seeing that dessert being lit on fire before slicing into it? What a fun treat to have at the holidays. 
fire brings warmth and light and it just feels so exciting to be able to do that during this chilly dark and festive time of year so let's give this a try and see what i think well, that's actually really good i have had christmas puddings before i've made them in the past but i've never made this recipe and to be honest in the past i didn't really like it really heavy and dense and just chock full of dried fruit, but I actually find this version to be a lot lighter. Um, there, the flour and the breadcrumbs creates a, a little bit of space between those pieces of dried fruit, making it more light and cake-like. So I actually really like this one. And the suet really gives it a moistness. Um, I definitely recommend trying to find that if you're in the U.S. I know it's hard to find, but it's worth the search. You can also taste the brandy and the spices. Honestly, just the whole smell of it, it just smells like Christmas. It's really a hearty and perfect treat for this time of year. As I said before, this video is a collaboration with Gary over at Big Spud. Make sure to watch his video, which I've linked below. He candies an entire orange and then steams it inside the Christmas pudding. So when you slice into it, you get a slice of that candied orange. I can't wait to try his recipe. That sounds amazing. Make sure to check out his channel and subscribe. He makes some really interesting stuff often featuring recipes from famous chefs like Marco Pierre White, and also occasionally doing some product reviews for kitchen gadgets. He's got a great channel, so definitely hit that subscribe button over on his channel. If you're coming over from Gary's channel to mine, hi, I'm Kristen, welcome to Bake Across Europe. Every week I make a recipe from a different European country and explore the history and traditions associated with each recipe. I, if that's something that interests you, definitely hit that subscribe button. I have a lot coming up in the next couple of weeks for Christmas. I have another flaming treat next week, as well as a Christmas cookie series coming up in December. So you're not going to want to miss that. While you're waiting for the next video, check out my Austrian apple strudel and my German red wine cake. Those are perfect to bring to holiday events this time of year. And I'll see you next time.